Hello everyone, my name is Jacqueline Neal. I'm the director of the Center for Asian Legal Studies. Um, thank you for joining us for today's virtual roundtables on Asian Law Series. Um, today we brought together a, a fabulous group of experts who will be speaking on criminal law reform in Asia. And today's session will be moderated by um, Dr. Weiling Chia from the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. Now, this particular series was started in May this year as our response to the pandemic, but also to bring together expert views um, from all around Asia to speak on topical issues on law in Asia. And for today's session, we are, I'm very proud and very happy to be collaborating with our good friends at Melbourne Law School's Asian Law Center to bring um, the various expert perspectives together to speak on today's topic. Now, before I hand over to Wei Ling, um, I would like to invite Sarah Bidov, who will be to speak a little bit about the Asian Law Center and our collaboration. Sarah. Thank you, Jacqueline. So good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, let me add my welcome to you all um, and um, to say how delighted uh, we are at the Asian Law Center uh, to be co-hosting this event um, with the Center for Asian Legal Studies at NUS Faculty of Law. As Jacqueline said, um, we've collaborated over many years um, and even though you know, there are many disadvantages of the pandemic um, and in Singapore, I think you call it the circuit breaker, but in Australia, we call it the lockdown, um, but it has created opportunities uh, for us to collaborate virtually um, and so we might say that, that this is the, the one good thing that's come out of, of this terrible uh, time. Um, and I, I'd just like to add my uh, congratulations um, to all of the panellists because this is really um, a very interesting uh, seminar. Uh, the topics that all of the speakers will talk on uh, are very interesting and uh, will be very thought provoking. And it provides us a really fabulous opportunity uh, to think comparatively um, across the region. Um, so um, can I say congratulations for today and also to say that I look forward to um, the Asian Law Centre um, and the Centre for Asian Legal Studies um, collaborating a lot more in future. Um, and we look forward to seeing all of you again at this and in future. So without further ado, let me please turn to Wei Ling, um, who will be um, in charge of moderating this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack, Clint and Sarah. Um, so there have been significant law reform efforts in the Asia Pacific region in recent years. So for example, Singapore undertook a substantial reform in 2019. And these law reform efforts are particularly interesting as many Asian countries, specifically those which were former British colonies, have had the same penal code in substantially the same form since introduction by the British colonial authorities. So I'm really looking forward to our panel today and to hear from our experts. So our participants are experts on common law, criminal law, law reform. And I understand from our fantastic administrator, Sina, thanks for helping to organize this, Sina, that we have quite a few participants from civil law systems here today. And we're really looking forward to their participation and questions. In terms of questions, please use the Q&A channel. The button is on the bottom of the screen. What we will do is that we will address all questions at the end of everyone's presentation for organizational purposes. In terms of timekeeping, each speaker will be speaking for up to 15 minutes. I apologize, but I will have to intervene to ensure that we have enough time for Q&A after that. Q&A will be around 30 minutes. The entire session will last 90 minutes. It will end at 12.30. So in terms of our speakers, we will first hear from Professor Stanley Yeo from the National University of Singapore. He'll be talking about, he'll give an overview of the various law reform efforts undertaken um, in various countries such as Singapore, Bhutan, Malaysia. And then we will hear from Professor Michael Ho from the University of Hong Kong, and he'll be presenting on gross indecency and the death penalty in Hong Kong and Singapore. We will then move on to hear from Professor Faranini Binti Tsuki from the University of Malaya, 
she'll be speaking on Malaysia's path towards abolition of the death penalty, about public sentiment versus political will. Then we will hear from Professor Jamie Walvish from the University of Melbourne, who will be presenting on the successful law reform campaign he was recently involved in to change the way uh, by which pers personality disorders are taken into account during the sentencing process. So I will now pass this on to Professor Stanley Yeo. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Willing. Uh, when I first uh, was first invited to speak on today's roundtable topic of criminal law reform in Asia, several broad themes immediately came to mind. One of these is political inertia, that is the lack of a political will to implement criminal law reform in any comprehensive way. This phenomena, I believe, isn't confined to Asia alone, and I venture to suggest that a major explanation is because criminal law involves moral or societal values and expectations which, due to their diversity and sometimes contentious nature, politicians are loath to engage with. I note that the panelists, uh, some of them that will, be, will um, follow up from me, will be touching on some of these issues. With this as a backdrop, I would like to discuss two other broad themes which comprise influences on criminal law reform in Asia. The first of these is the role of legal scholarship in helping to move criminal law reform along. And the second is the past and ongoing influence of Western criminal jurisprudence on criminal law reform in Asia. I appreciate that these are huge topics each of which could take up the program of a whole conference. Hence, my objective here will simply be to arouse your interest on these matters. So these two topics that I will be covering briefly in the allocated time comprise legal scholarship, followed by Western notions of criminal responsibility and criminal justice. Dealing firstly with legal scholarship, I will be speaking or sharing with you about the Singapore experience uh, firsthand. And I apologize uh, in advance if what I'm going to share in the next five minutes or so sounds like I belong to a Lexus Nexus uh, sales uh, department in trying to sell you books. The Singapore Penal Code is largely the Indian Penal Code of 1860. Some of you in the audience may not be familiar with this, so um, I will just elaborate. The Indian Penal Code uh, was implemented in 1860, that's 160 years ago, uh, during the height of the British Raj. And it was so successful that the British administrators decided to transplant the IPC, Indian Penal Code, to uh, its outer reaches. These included uh, Burma, now Myanmar, uh, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, the Malay Federated States, the uh, Strait Settlements, uh, including Singapore. Now the Indian Penal Code being 160 years old, we, uh, is basically still relatively indicated because it hasn't really been um, dealt with largely uh, in any kind of concerted or comprehensive form in terms of major reform over the 160 years. I venture to suggest that an explanation of political inertia that I had flagged at the outset of my uh, presentation uh, is the chief culprit. So that being the case, what can be done to move major uh, penal code reforms, uh, at least in relation to uh, IPC jurisdictions. And I would be, by the way, uh, uh, keen uh, to hear from uh, participants from other uh, civil law jurisdictions or elsewhere in Asia who are listening in, whether this uh, is a similar kind of phenomenon uh, that you are experiencing, political inertia and the difficulty of uh, 
uh, getting the legislature of your jurisdictions to actually engage in criminal law reform in a substantive way. So I move on to uh, share with you very briefly uh, uh, first-hand uh, experience of how uh, Singapore actually managed to actually move this along. Uh, as uh, Wuling had uh, intimated in her in introduction, uh, if you see at the very bottom of the slide that you have there, uh, we have very recently in Singapore, uh, the passing of the Criminal Law Reform Act of last year, with most of which came into force this year. So how did that really come about? Well, I would suggest that uh, the legal scholarship had a significant role uh, in moving this along. Now, when I came over to Singapore from Australia, I uh, used to work in uh, various universities in Australia. I came over in 2007 to the National University of Singapore and uh, was uh, assigned to teach uh, criminal law. And uh, at that stage, uh, there were several books, uh, uh, textbooks uh, on criminal law in Singapore, but all of which were, although very good ones, nonetheless, basically cases and materials. There wasn't a single textbook that was what you would call a comprehensive analytical uh, text, prescribed text. So I managed to persuade a couple of uh, colleagues uh, Chan Wing Kiong, now at S Singapore Management University, and Neil Morgan, who uh, used to be uh, at the University of Singapore but uh, had moved over to Australia, to collaborate in coming out with a book uh, entitled Criminal Law in Malaysia and Singapore. So that was the first major textbook, and uh, that was published in 2008. Uh, and became a prescribed text in Singapore. Uh, it's a side story as to why it didn't really succeed in Malaysia uh, in, in getting the same kind of um, attention uh, in the law schools in Malaysia. But in Singapore, uh, it became the prescribed text. Uh, and then a few years later, in the move towards uh, 2010, which was the uh, 150th anniversary of the Indian Penal Code uh, of 1860, uh, I noted that there wasn't anything being done in India, Singapore, or elsewhere, all IPC jurisdictions. Nothing uh, was go going to be done, was being done to celebrate, as it were, uh, the, the, this uh, very important anniversary. So uh, in uh, Singapore, we organized a special uh, symposium. I think several of the uh, participants in this symposium would recall uh, that special uh, seminar where we had uh, over three days uh, looking seriously at the Indian Penal Code and uh, seeing how uh, it could be, as it were, revitalized, modernized. And so we had uh, experts coming from England, Australia, Malaysia, India to participate in uh, this forum. And the uh, outcome of that was a, a collection of essays uh, from the symposium that was published in 2011 called Codification, Macaulay and the Indian Penal Code, The Legacies and Modern Challenges of Criminal Law Reform. Now this was then followed shortly after by a book uh, proposing a model penal code for Singapore. Um, Michael Ho, um, Chan Ming Chong, and myself wrote this book, uh, a spin off in a way from the essays uh, from that symposium that I just, just mentioned. And uh, this book, Criminal Law for the 21st Century, a model code for Singapore, uh, succinctly uh, laid down. Um, what the law was in Singapore on uh, one a particular general principle of criminal responsibility, went on to have a section on a uh, brief section on comparative uh, law, drawing particularly from England and Australia. And then uh, the final part of each chapter comprised a proposal, a provision uh, 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 that uh, would uh, update uh, or else fill in some gap that the Singapore Penal Code uh, did not have or was um, uh, in need for. Uh, 
So this is, in summary, were, um, as it were, a collection of legal scholarship, one leading into the other. And then this is where it becomes important. The next point in the development of, um, or getting the law to change, in Singapore at least, was the participation of uh, the courts themselves. So you notice there in the that dot point in the slide, a healthy judicial culture or practice of citing legal scholarship in judgments. So fortunately, our courts in Singapore actually made it a point to refer to the various one or more of these various books that I've just uh, been telling you that had, that had then become available. And that, of course, had a fantastic spin-off effect on prosecutors and defense lawyers because the, the judges were actually leading the way, as it were, in saying that secondary sources uh, of law from uh, legal academics uh, were very important in their deliberations. So that was uh, an, ex uh, an excellent uh, development. Uh, so uh, much appreciation to the judiciary. Now, unfortunately, again, I must say that in Malaysia, because if you recall the textbook on uh, the, the first textbook, which was Criminal Law in Malaysia and Singapore, which is incidentally went on into its third edition, very, very few Malaysian judges uh, have actually cited it. Um, why that is the case uh, is, is a matter of conjecture. But again, just confining ourselves to the Singapore experience, uh, certainly the judiciary's uh, um, citation of uh, these various uh, forms of legal scholarship definitely move uh, criminal law reform along. And then the uh, third um, part of this um, uh, collaboration was a personal engagement with individual politicians and high government officials. So I won't mention who they are, but I guess you could say that uh, Singapore being, you know, the, the efficient and effective and small uh, city state that it is, uh, there were all these kind of personal contacts, you know, so, uh, you know, you could go for lunch or have a meeting with uh, ministers and senior government officials to actually push uh, one's, uh, a case or a, a proposal to actually have a major uh, law reform of the Singapore Penal Code. So um, the combined result of legal scholarship, a healthy judicial culture or practice of citing legal scholarship and personal engagement with individual politicians and high government officials led to, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, creation of a criminal law reform committee uh, to look into it. Uh, that was, um, a number of us were also actually part of that committee. Uh, so it reviewed uh, the whole uh, penal code uh, for over a period of one and a half years, came out with a report in 2018, and most of the recommendations of that committee uh, were eventually enacted in uh, 2019. All right, so moving on from there uh, to uh, the extending the Singapore experience further afield. So this uh, is basically uh, tentative uh, in uh, whether or not it, it has achieved or has the potential of achieving the same kind of effect as uh, in Singapore. So in the same way as, uh, as I mentioned, you know, IPC jurisdictions like Myanmar, Sri Lanka, India, um, I'll mention Bhutan a, a little later on. But the idea was uh, that we, in collaboration, myself in collaboration with a team of uh, uh, criminal law legal experts, uh, would uh, collaborate with uh, a, 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 a one of the senior uh, criminal law professors uh, in these jurisdictions. Uh, to uh, produce a criminal law text. Uh, so uh, that was a starting point like that, had, that happened in Singapore. And we were hoping that that would also be the starting point. Firstly, in Myanmar, where um, through a number of few studies and I think Professor Kim Kim Woo uh, is participating, she also collaborated with this project. We came up with a book called Criminal Law in Myanmar, 
uh, same idea, stating what the law was, stating what the uh, comparative uh, analysis of the, uh, bringing the law up to date, and then proposals for reform. So Myanmar, the book was published in 2016. Unfortunately, I don't know how it's going, whether it's a prescribed text, whether judges are citing it, uh, uh, practitioners, I, I'm in the dark about what's happened there. Sri Lanka was the next one. We have got Professor Jiva Nirela from Colombo University, who is also listening in. She was our local collaborator for that uh, project. So similarly, we came out with a book called Criminal Law in Sri Lanka. And um, uh, in the next couple of years, we have just signed a contract to have uh, a similar kind of text for India. And Professor Mrinal Satesh from the Bangalore uh, Law School, who's also in attendance, is our chief collaborator. And then uh, further afield, not an IPC jurisdiction, but Bhutan, uh, again in attendance, uh, my team will be uh, collaborating with uh, Professor Bema Lam from the uh, JSW Law School in Bhutan, who is again listening in, to uh, produce a uh, prescribed text for Bhutan in 2023. Okay, so um, just a very quick uh, note here, of, especially for uh, teachers in our midst, the role of legal education, the long-term influence of criminal law textbooks and other legal publications on new generations of judges, legal practitioners, legal officers, and lawyer turned politicians. So uh, without elaborating, just to say that uh, you think about the Singapore experience, uh, uh, once you actually have a prescribed text which you actually are able to actually teach to your law students, they are the future lawyers, the judges, the politicians of your jurisdiction. So, there's no really better way I can think of, uh, at least in the long term, of uh, inculcating this uh, questioning mind of where or what is the form of, uh, uh, of the criminal law or criminal justice system of one's jurisdiction and uh, to, to be critical about it and to, with a view to criminal law reform. Okay, in the remaining time that I have, I'll just very quickly uh, uh, point to another, what I would regard as a, another important influence on um, criminal law reform in uh, Asia. And here I'm really going to flag uh, it as an issue uh, rather than offer uh, solutions. Uh, Western notions of criminal responsibility and criminal justice. So if you look at the IPC jurisdictions, uh, these continue to be premised on 19th century Western, that is largely Judeo-Christian moral principles. For example, the crim criminalization of sodomy, and also forms of punishment such as the death penalty and corporal punishment. They basically go back to your legal history of British 19th century Victorian notions of justice and uh, of, 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 of uh, forms of sentencing and penalties. So the question is, uh, in, in Asia, uh, are we happy and content to actually continue uh, adopting uh, the uh, uh, this is, uh, lastly uh, Western underpinnings? I mean, I should also say that uh, if you look at least in Singapore and uh, India and other jurisdictions, if ever there was, you know, he had some kind of issue where the courts had to mull over, very often they would again uh, look to. Uh, especially English, English law, English developments, uh, which would again uh, reflect uh, Western uh, notions of uh, 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 you know, criminal responsibility and the like. Is this a good thing uh, uh, or is it acceptable? Uh, that's a question. Now, 19th century IPC jurisdictions, you could understand because of the legal history behind it. But uh, Bhutan, where I've had the uh, opportunity to actually work for the last couple of years, uh, is an interesting phenomenon because I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt Stanley, just to let you know that your time is up. So, but please, please continue to finish. Okay, just uh, another, just one more minute. Thank you. Uh, very recent example of transplantation of Western criminal code in an Asian con country, 2004, uh, Bhutan's penal code largely adopted the US model penal code of 1962. Right. So uh, that was, uh, and I think Bhutan is already feeling it. Uh, uh, there are many uh, provisions in the, their code uh, which seem to run counter to cultural religious norms 
drawn from Buddhist principles and of restorative justice practices in the community. Right? So I, I leave you with this question. Is there room for a distinct Asian criminal law uh, or justice jurisprudence? Thank you. Thank you very much, Stanley, for that fascinating presentation. We'll now move to Professor Ho. We'll be talking about Hong Kong and Singapore. Right, um, let me perform this share screen thing. Just a few seconds. Right, I assume that the, the share screen is working. Uh, and uh, well, uh, what I'm going to say actually is that it's uh, a good uh, compliment to, to Stan, what Stanley was talking about. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think Stanley's uh, uh, um, talk was, was essentially on sort of regular criminal law. Yeah. It, it, by that, I mean um, a criminal law which is driven primarily by criminal justice considerations. Yeah. Um, what I will be talking about is, uh, are, are two particular areas, yeah, that by no means the only ones, um, uh, where it would appear that criminal justice considerations uh, somehow take a back seat. Yeah, and that there's some other um, uh, uh, force, some other uh, uh, impetus that's going on, yeah, uh, apart from criminal justice considerations. Yeah. And I've chosen uh, uh, two uh, such areas. Yeah. One is the death penalty and the other is um, uh, gross indecency yeah, or same-sex uh, uh, sexual activity. Yeah. Um, I uh, can only profess uh, 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 expertise in uh, essentially two jurisdictions. Yeah. So um, uh, it's Singapore and Hong Kong. Yeah. And it makes a, a fascinating uh, comparison because um, despite the similarities between these two uh, jurisdictions, um, the paths that they have taken uh, are quite different, yeah, and uh, um, it's interesting to see why. Yeah. Um, I think um, I I don't need to 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 go too much into the similarities between Singapore and, and Hong Kong, yeah, right. Uh, um, the the principal ones, of course, being that um, uh, both were British colonies, uh, both inherited the common law, uh, and um, notwithstanding the fact that um, Hong Kong never adopted the penal code as such, yeah, so. It, it, Hong Kong's criminal law is very is very much like uh, English criminal law, um, uh, uh, so it's a, it's a it's it's a it's a mixture of uh, of common law and, uh, and statutes modifying the common law. Yeah. Um, so uh, apart from that, I, I would think more or less technical difference. Yeah. Um, the the similarities are are, are quite uh, uh, persuasive. Yeah. Right. Um, small. It, uh, small jurisdictions, uh, a very strong common law, English speaking tradition, uh, 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 predominantly uh, uh, sort of a, well, Chinese, overseas Chinese culture. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, there, there are differences, of course, uh, in, in, in uh, Singapore's uh, 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 demographics, yeah, but uh, uh, still predominantly uh, Chinese, overseas Chinese culture. Yeah. Um, now, um, as you can imagine, yeah, uh, uh, it, the death penalty, right? Um, uh, the uh, at one time, of course, um, uh, both Singapore and Hong Kong um, uh, uh, brought in the the the, the practice of uh, executions, yeah, uh, as British colonial practice in the nineteenth century. Yeah, uh, Singapore is actually a little older, yeah, uh, eighteen nineteen. Yeah, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, sort sort of became more became significant only uh, a couple of decades after that, yeah. um, but very similar uh, phenomenon. Yeah. The death penalty was 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 brought in by the by the colonial administrators, yeah. um, and um, in Singapore um, uh, after the penal code was enacted, yeah, right. Uh, essentially, there was a mandatory death penalty for murder, discretionary death penalty for treason. Uh, and uh, again, mandatory death penalty for piracy endangering life. Yeah, Hong Kong is almost an exact mirror of that. Yeah, through the common law and through through Victorian statutes. Yeah, so again, mandatory for murder. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was mandatory or discretionary for treason. Yeah, uh, but it's likely to have been. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I'll have to look that one up. Yeah, but um, uh, and of course that piracy uh, uh, provision. Yeah, it was also in in Hong Kong. Yeah. So, and in practice, um, uh, very similar. Uh, so there were executions, but um, uh, mainly, if not exclusively for murder, yeah, both in Singapore and in Hong Kong. Yeah. 
So this was a uh, colonial Singapore, colonial, colonial Hong Kong. Yeah. Now, um, things began to diverge. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Singapore achieved self-government in 1959. Yeah. And since, uh, uh, sorry, self-government in 59 and independence, well, from Malaysia yeah, in 1965. Yeah. And since then, uh, and after that, yeah, Singapore went into what I, I, I would uh, cheekily call the golden age of the death penalty. Yeah. Um, where the, um, the, uh, the government of Singapore, yeah, now the independent government of Singapore, yeah, um, um, introduced uh, uh, death penal the death penalty to, to, to uh, a, 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 a few other crimes, yeah, right? um, essentially kidnapping, discretionary, firearms mandatory, and drugs mandatory. Yeah. And the drugs one is the, is the, the drugs, uh, death penalty for drugs is the one that is statistically significant. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and um, in a famous uh, Amnesty and International report in, in 2004, yeah, um, and it's, it's splashed uh, across the headlines all over the world, yeah, that uh, Singapore had the highest per capita execution rate in the world. Yeah. So this was uh, it figures uh, in, in, the, in the 1990s to the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, and this is quite an achievement, I mean, to, to, to uh, best even... Uh, uh, United States, uh, Iran, and and, and uh, such uh, Saudi Arabia and such other countries, which are uh, more commonly associated with the death penalty. Yeah. Now, Hong Kong took a a, a very different path. Yeah. So, in 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 1965, uh, well, most of us know that um, it, it, in, Brit in the British abolished the death penalty yeah, in 1965. Yeah, and the and Hong Kong seemed to be following suit. Yeah. And Hong Kong's last execution was actually in 1966. Yeah, and uh, but but um, the uh, the death penalty was not uh, formally abolished until 1993. Yeah. Nonetheless, yeah, the last execution being in 1966. So between 66 and and 93, um, the, the the practice is the familiar one of uh, uh, of people being sentenced to death but not executed. Yeah. So there was a moratorium on executions. Yeah. So what happened was that uh, people were routinely pardoned by the governor. Yeah. In, in one striking uh, uh, event in 1973, um, the governor refused to pardon uh, a particular uh, offender yeah, uh, for murder, but, but he was promptly overruled by London. Yeah. So Her Majesty in London, uh, Her Majesty's government, yeah, um, uh, said that they, they would not practically said that it would not, under any circumstances, allow an execution to go on. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, in 1993, there was the formal abolition. Yeah. Um, uh, now, after that, yeah, so we come now to the, the, the perhaps the, 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 the modern period, the, 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 the modern, modern period. Yeah. And um, the, the interesting thing is that, are, are we seeing a reconvergence? Yeah. So if you see Singapore moving off in, into the death penalty uh, uh, enthusiast uh, sort of world and uh, Hong Kong going to, towards abolition. And now the, the, the trends uh, may, may be, um, be reversed. Yeah. Um, why do I say this? Yeah. Um, now in Singapore, um, since uh, Amnesty's report in 2004, yeah, um, there have been a dramatic reduction in executions. Yeah, um, from being the world's highest to you know, um, it's, it's now off the charts. Yeah, it's off, not off the charts, and you have a, a whole num uh, a whole stack of jurisdictions which are above Singapore now. Yeah, it still executes, but much less. Yeah. And um, in 2014, um, not so long ago, there were amendments put in place, yeah, uh, providing a, an escape route, as, as it were, for, for people who are mere couriers of, 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 uh, of uh, drugs, yeah, and who cooperated with the investigations, yeah. Now, um, the jury is still out as to whether um, it, it, it has actually reduced uh, 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 the executions, but uh, even if it didn't, yeah, uh, symbolically, symbolically, it is, I think, a retreat, yeah. Um, and um, one is also able to see yeah, in, the, in, in recent um, uh, judicial decisions yeah, of the highest court, yeah, court of appeal, yeah, a certain intensification of judicial scrutiny of, um, uh, uh, of capital cases, yeah, right? So we have, uh, we've had, um, uh, I'm not sure the line or string or several strings or several lines, but uh, 
we've had this 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 uh, 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 group of cases yeah um, which quite surprised which quite surprised the local profession yeah uh, which resulted in capital convictions being overturned yeah for for a whole set of reasons yeah and uh, many of which uh, uh, had to do with uh, assessment of evidence and all that yeah and um, um, observers um, uh, uh, think that you know this this these acquittals would not have happened yeah uh, 15 20 years ago yeah right and um, uh, very recently very recently the the, the topic of uh, the death penalty came up again yeah in uh, in singapore and um, the attempts by the government to justify the use of the death penalty in Singapore. I struggle for, for a word to describe it, yeah, and uh, I, I think I will settle for half-hearted, yeah. Um, uh, for those of you who, who um, are following this, yeah, um, uh, the recent attempts by the government to, to justify the death penalty, yeah, uh, uh, it's not going to convince anyone if you, if you don't, if, if you're not convin convinced already, yeah. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it, it, it's a, you know, it, it, it's it's almost as if um, uh, they had to say something, so they said something, yeah, right. Um, and uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to me to provide provide any evidence, yeah, for for a belief in the death penalty. Yeah. So, um, um, but the fact that it, it has come up and, and rather more recently, yeah, uh, uh, several times, yeah, is because of the 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 I think a mounting pressure yeah, against the the use of the death penalty in in, in Singapore, yeah. So we see, um, uh, 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 if not if not a, a shift, then a, a stop in the uh, 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 the growing enthusiasm for the death penalty. Yeah. Um, Hong Kong, of course, uh, the uh, on the ground things are still very much the same. Yeah. But what has happened recently in Hong Kong is um, the enactment of the national the national security law. Yeah, and this law was not enacted by Hong Kong; it was enacted uh, by the Chinese mainland government yeah, for Hong Kong. Yeah. Something which it had the, has the power to do so, yeah, under the basic law, yeah. And um, there is one particular provision which has uh, bothered um, uh, many people, and this is the power of a discretionary transfer of people suspected of breaching the national security law of Hong Kong, a transfer of these uh, suspects to the mainland for proce processing and trial, yeah. In other words, investigation, trial, and so on, yeah. Now, um, uh, the the precondition seems to be in complicated cases, but um, you know, um, uh, no indication of what that means here, right? Uh, now, the national security law itself doesn't have any um, uh, capital offenses here. The highest is uh, life imprisonment here. But as the uh, Secretary for Justice uh, of Hong Kong recently had to admit, once the transfer is made, there is nothing to stop the mainland authorities, mainland courts. Right from slapping on uh, a, a capital uh, a charge, yeah. right? So Hong Kong, unlike a, a, a sovereign country, is not in a position to bargain with Beijing, yeah, right? Um, so if if you know uh, between two two sovereign countries, one might might tell the other one, look, I'll, I will hand him over to you, provided you don't uh, execute him, yeah. But uh, Hong Kong is not in a position to 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 impose such conditions uh, on the mainland, yeah. So. Um, uh, and this is the fear, yeah, that uh, uh, now it is perfectly possible for, for someone uh, uh, to be sentenced to death yeah, and, and executed for something which he does in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, now, um, theoretic, theoretically, of course, yeah, uh, the, the, the mainland government has always had the power to, to reintroduce the death penalty uh, 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 into Hong Kong. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be uh, the, the Hong Kong Legislative Council, which does it, yeah. So um, uh, China can do it for them. Yeah. Um, you might ask, uh, why? Why the divergence uh, and why the convergence and so on? Yeah, right. Um, uh, 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 I think um, for Singapore, the, um, uh, the what what drove the, the what I call the golden age of the death penalty was was perhaps uh, uh, two things. Yeah, one was I think a, a genuine belief that it worked. Yeah, it worked in deterring crime. Yeah. And uh, uh, those of us, those of you who have read uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew's uh, uh, autobiography, yeah, yeah, will see that he was greatly impressed by the Japanese occupation experience. Yeah, he said that uh, during the Japanese occupation of of Singapore, everybody left their doors open and nobody stole anything. Why? Because if you were if the the, uh, the Japanese suspected you of stealing anything, they they would just chop off your head. Yeah. So and that. Uh, uh, you know, was a deterrent to, to any sort of criminal activity. Yeah. And um, 
the second reason I think yeah, it, it, was, it was more than just a, a criminal justice thing. Yeah. It, it, I think it was a, a symbol, yeah, a, a symbol of who's boss yeah, in, in the government citizen relationship. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, uh, so um, uh, what has uh, happened yeah, since two, the 2004, uh, this, this um, uh, uh, sort of waning enthusiasm for the death penalty, yeah, I think that is, was, is probably triggered by the, by the fact that there is really, I think, no real conviction yeah, in the government that it works. Yeah. Now, if there is a real conviction that, 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 that the death penalty has worked so wonderfully for, for Singapore, the drastic reduction in executions after 2004 cannot be explained. Yeah. Right? Um, so uh, I think that rationale is now gone or at least very shaky. Um, but I think what remains is the second one, yeah? the, the sort of political significance of who's boss yeah? in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the government citizen relationship. Yeah? Now, even that, even that may now maybe, may, uh, be, be, well, may be called into question. Yeah? Um, and uh, there are generational changes in, in, in Singapore, things which the older generation will prepare to accept. Hi, Michael. Yeah. I'm just intervening to let you know that your time is up. It's up completely. Please, yes. Okay. Yes, okay. But, yeah. Okay. I'll, can you give me uh, two minutes to finish? Yes. 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 Just to let you know. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so um, the there are generational changes and uh, the, the things which the older generation were will, will prepared to accept. Yeah. Um, uh, the 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 younger generation uh, perhaps are not. Yeah. And this was demonstrated by the the, the results of the recent general elections 2020. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, uh, Hong Kong, um, uh, a great deal of the impetus yeah, for, for um, well, the, the, the reason for the moratorium after 1965, uh, 1966 um, was, I think, essentially a colonial one, yeah? um, as in you, you, you follow the mother country. Yeah? Um, but I think the, 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 in, the, the impetus in 1993, uh, in formal abolition, was um, uh, a fear of mainland encroachment. Yeah, the, 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 the fear was that if the death penalty remained on the books, um, uh, it might be used yeah, by true mainland influence. Yeah, to to um, uh, you know to sort of tame Hong Kong. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, and with the with the enactment of the national security law, that this this uh, uh, feeds into the uh, um, fear. Yeah. Um, so uh, why does Singapore still retain it? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, uh, the answer is, is that I think it has more to do with politics than, than criminal justice. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there is no significant difference in serious crime rates, perceptions of public safety, and, and even public opinion in you know, the death penalty between Singapore and Hong Kong. Yeah. If, you, if you poll the, the, the people of uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, you're probably likely to come up with the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, 50, 50, 50, 40, 60 kind of a, 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 a division between those who agree and those who don't. Yeah. So um, uh, that I think uh, uh, is the situation. Yeah. I have no time to discuss the second one, which I wanted to. Uh, so um, I, I will perhaps leave that for Q and A if uh, if uh, there are any. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I'm sure we'll find some time to discuss uh, your, your thoughts on gross indecency during the Q&A. We will now move on to uh, Professor uh, to Dr. Farah from the University of Malaya. Good morning. First of all, thank you. Thanks to NUS for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to be here today with all of you, uh, with a distinguished speakers and panel. Um, well, um, Professor Ho has made my task easier because I do not need them to, to go behind the rationale of death penalty and all that. So I'm just going straight to the topic of malicious path towards the abolition of death penalty. Um, we will be looking at you know, public sentiment against political will. Now the current state of affairs, now as of October 2019, there were two, 1,275 inmates who have been sentenced to death, including 24 who have failed in all their possibilities of appeals and pardon. But all have been given moratorium pending the outcome of the process uh, towards abolishing mandatory death penalty. Um, for the record, from 2010 till now, there have been 33 executions, uh, mostly for drug trafficking um, and murder. Now, let's look at political will. 
In 2010, um, the former law minister, Datuk Sri Muhammad Nazri Aziz, had publicly stated that death penalty is not suitable in Malaysia because he recognised that Malaysia had an imperfect criminal justice system since there was a high risk of miscarriages of justice. And since then, um, it uh, twinkled upon studies being undertaken to review the efficacy of laws relating to the death sentence. Um, there were two major reports on this. The first one, um, the death penalty in Malaysia, public opinion on the mandatory death penalty for drug trafficking, murder and firearm offences was published in 2013 and this is uh, what I, I will be referring to as the first study. And secondly, the report on the death penalty in Malaysia and the way forward, a review of the death penalty laws and its practices in Malaysia. And um, this was um, organized and initiated by the International Centre for Law and Legal Studies um, within the Attorney General's Chambers, AGC. And both studies were actually conducted by Emeritus Professor Roger Hood from England. Um, and as we know, uh, in 2018, with the change of uh, government, after the general election, uh, one of the manifesto in the Pakatan Harapan government uh, was to abolish the mandatory death penalty and um, the effort is ongoing. How about public sentiment? Now, the survey in the first study of a representative sample uh, showed of Malaysian citizens from all over the country uh, were released on July 8, 2013 and suggested that uh, there would be little public opposition to the abolition of the mandatory penalty for drug trafficking, murder and firearms offences. And this led to the um, more official study commissioned by the former Attorney General, Tan Sri Abdul Ghani Fatail. And at the study's conclusion in 2016, ICELS, the International Center for Law and Legal Studies, recommended to the cabinet the total abolition of uh, the death penalty in Malaysia. Now, um, the, in, the result of the two studies, and, and also with political will, of course, um, it resulted in um, the effectiveness of the death penalty as a deterrent recognized in the amendment to the Dangerous Drugs Act 1952, uh, which removed the mandatory death penalty for, for the drug-related offenses. And uh, the then minister said that this was a baby step towards the eventual uh, total abolition of the death penalty. However, it is to be noted that um, the mandatory death penalty was removed, the discretionary death penalty remained, and um, uh, similarly to what um, Professor Ho said, there, were, uh, there are still uh, four conditions that need to be proven before uh, the accused um, can actually um, be let off for the discretionary death penalty. Otherwise, it is, it is you know, it's as good as it being mandatory because of the difficulty of proving the four conditions. So public sentiment, the most recent and extensive study was the one done in 2013 by Professor Roger Hood. And um, initially, although generally there seemed to be a, a high support for death penalty, but the support for death penalty decreased when they were given, the respondents were given actual scenarios. Now, this was the sample I spoke earlier of 1,535 Malaysian citizens. And in theory, they say they are in favor of the death penalty, whether it's mandatory or discretionary. And these were the actual results. Now, it's interesting to note that, you know, for, for either mandatory or discretionary, for murder, 91% supported. For mandatory death penalty, the number goes lesser. Uh, about 50%. For drug trafficking, between 74 to 80%. And again, when it's made mandatory, the number beca became lesser. Uh, similarly with firearms. So from here, we could see that um, mandatory death penalty definitely has, has less support among public opinion. Now, level of support in theory versus real reality. This was what Professor Hood uh, summarized. Uh, when asked to say what sentences they would themselves impose on a series of scenario, which all of which were subject to a mandatory death sentence, a large gap was found between level of support in theory and the level of support when faced with reality. 
For example, for none of the four scenario drug trafficking, they, you know, more than 30% choose the death penalty. Even in one case, it was a case of smuggling 25 kilograms of heroin. Only 8% choose death uh, in the scenario cases that they uh, judged. And regarding the six murder scenarios, six murder scenarios, a majority chose uh, death in only three of the cases, the highest proportion being for a recidivist robber. And of the 56% who said they favoured the mandatory death penalty for murder, whatever the circumstances, um, really only 14% um, only of them actually chose the death penalty for all the scenario cases they judged. Now, this was only 8% of the total number of the respondents. So when judging two scenarios where a firearm had been discharged during a burglary, only 20% chose death in the most serious case where the person fired at has been wounded. So, well, in conclusion, only 1.2 persons in 100 thought that the death penalty was the appropriate punishment for all the 12 scenario cases of murder, drug trafficking and firearm offences that were judged. This showed decisively that the vast majority favoured a discretionary use of death penalty rather than mandatory. And the main reason why people chose the death penalty was retribution and when against it, they said it would be a disproportionate punishment. And deterrence was mentioned by no more than 15%. And when interviewees were asked whether they would support the death penalty, if it were proven that innocent persons had been executed, the proportion in favour for murder fell to 33%, for drug trafficking to 26%, and to 23% for firearm offences. So conclusions derived in the study is that greater number of executions was ranked as the least effective policy for reducing very violent crimes leading to death and for reducing the amount of trafficking in illegal drugs. Now this finding suggests that there would be little public opposition to abolition of the mandatory death penalty for drug trafficking, murder and firearm offences and public support for the death penalty for murder is also lower than is perhaps assumed so may not be regarded as a definite barrier to abolition. Now let's look at more recent developments because those were in 2013 and 2016. Um, the um, Pakatan Harapan's um, success, uh, about a year later, on the 5th of July, there was the proposal to replace the mandatory death penalty with death penalty at the discretion of the court or alternative penalty. Um, and on the 12th of July, the government decided to abolish the mandatory death penalty of the 11 offences which were subjected to the mandatory death. Nine in the Penal Code and two in the Firearms Increase Penalties Act 1971. And on the 29th August, a month later, the Cabinet approved the setting up of a special committee to study and recommend alternative sentences to replace the mandatory death penalty. So it has to be clear here that um, on, the issue of uh, on the issue of abolishing mandatory death penalty that is settled, the committee is really to look into alternative sentences to replace the mandatory death penalty. And the special committee would conduct a comprehensive study and review of existing sentencing policy and recommend appropriate uh, replacement for the mandatory death penalty. Now, the committee um, consists of nine uh, individuals. Um, there were two former chief judges. One a retired um, Court of Appeal judge, one former um, Solicitor General, and one retired Senior Officer of the Prison Department, two ST members of the Bar Council, and two academics, um, a, one criminologist from uh, Science University of Malaysia, and um, myself from the Law Faculty of UM. And the method methodologies employed, um, I, I'm quite happy to share that uh, it was rather extensive. Uh, we conducted, uh, the committee conducted desk review, uh, wrote to many experts around the world to, to garner their views. We had online public survey, we conducted uh, town halls and there were also focus group discussions. Now, there were six general town halls. We went to Penang, Jaya, Jubabaru, Sabah, Sarawak and Kutubaru. Um, I'm not at liberty to uh, report on the uh, final outcome of the study, the, the recommendations that we made because it's now uh, awaiting for a presentation to the cabinet. But um, I can uh, share here that um, the feeling is almost uh, similar across the di different town halls in that uh, whilst um, 
many uh, were generally not supportive of total abolition, but generally uh, they were supportive of abolishing mandatory death penalty. And the focus group discussions, there were five. We conducted separate ones for, between the government MPs and the opposition MPs, the religious community, community leaders, Muslims and non-Muslims. And also uh, we met uh, representatives from the different CSOs and NGOs. And finally, um, we had uh, focus group discussions with affected parties, the death row in, uh, inmates themselves, the family members of the victims, and the family members of the death row inmates. Um, finally, the online public survey was conducted to garner public opinion on the abolition of mandatory death sentence and to obtain views on alternatives and punishments. And total of 6,284 were completed and received between uh, mid-December uh, to mid-January. And the findings of the study were presented to the Minister, um, uh, the late um, Yang Berhormat uh, Datuk Sri Wee Tong in February 2020. And as we all know, uh, many things happened post-February 2020. Uh, the government collapsed and um, and uh, COVID-19 pandemic took over and we are still waiting and hopeful. So way forward, um, there is still a lot of work of advocacy needs to be done, uh, sharing of findings. For example, among the reasons always given is that, oh, this is um, death penalty is uh, sanctioned by uh, religion, therefore it must be upheld, but really is it? So that is why um, there are studies currently being conducted on to see what are really the religious uh, scriptures that support uh, uh, death uh, penalty um, or rather dispute it. And this ought to be shared further so that the public will have clearer understanding of what really is required and what is not. Greater engagements between uh, political and community leaders and stakeholders so that um, greater understanding can be achieved. For example, it needs to be understood that our criminal justice system is definitely not a perfect one. Uh, mistakes happened and um, even the judges that we, uh, we met uh, express uh, that you know, they would be a lot more comfortable if the discretion is given because based on the facts of the case, when, when you know, when facing certain offences, it's really very difficult to decide and it would lead to, you know, them giving acquittals instead of conviction because giving a conviction would definitely lead to mandatory death sentence. And of course, um, we need to raise uh, and educate people, uh, raise public awareness by having programs on all levels of society um, to make them understand uh, what would be their implications. So until a firm decision is made in respect to, um, because uh, an act needs to be passed in order to uh, effectively abolish mandatory death sentence and laws need to be amended. And until that happened, moratorium is still in existing uh, for all of uh, those awaiting uh, death row. And, and also, uh, as I've said, at that time it was 1,275, it may be more now. Um, and also to see uh, what are we going to do with you know, those who have really uh, exhausted their appeals and um, pardon. Because until and unless uh, the death row is actually conducted, they, they, they will not really exhaust their opportunities to pardon. They can, they, there is no limit to obtaining pardon, but, but really, you know, uh, this, is, this is such a uh, putting, putting their lives at, at, at such an indefinite uh, state. And, I mean, you really need to actually meet uh, these people and, and actually see and listen from them uh, to understand um, what they go through, how terrible it is. Imagine waiting for, uh, waiting for, uh, you know, your, your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Farah, for that really interesting presentation. I will now move on to Dr. Jamie Walvich from University of Melbourne, who will be talking about the sentencing process. Apologies, uh, my I have not unmuted myself. Let me start again. Hello, everybody. Hopefully, you can now see me uh, and see my screen. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, thanks very much to Jacqueline and the Centre uh, for organising such an interesting event. I have very much enjoyed hearing each of the other presentations and look forward to the discussion afterwards. 
Uh, the reason that I've been asked to present here today is because I've had a long history in criminal law reform, having worked for various Australian law reform agencies over the past 20 years. Uh, and in this capacity, I have frequently been involved in what I consider to be a very traditional process of criminal law reform in Australia, which it sounds is very different from uh, other parts of Asia, uh, which is where the government identifies an area it considers to be in need of potential reform. Uh, and then it outsources its uh, research capacity to a quasi independent law reform agency, such as the Victorian Law Reform Commission, where I worked. Uh, these agencies then conduct their research. They meet with various stakeholders to discuss the relevant issues. Uh, and then they draft recommendations for the government who may or may not choose to implement them. Now, obviously, this is a very important and very useful process for achieving wide scale reforms of the system. So those kind of reforms that require governmental intervention and backing. But often there are smaller important issues that uh, really need to be addressed, but which are unlikely to make it onto the government's agenda, perhaps because they're not considered a priority, the kind of political inertia that Stanley mentioned, uh, or perhaps because they're even politically unpalatable, so no government will want to touch them. What do you do about these kind of issues? Well, there's obviously a number of ways in which you can try to do something. As an academic, you can write about it in the hope of inspiring some kind of change uh, in the way that Stanley mentioned has recently happened in Singapore. Uh, as a political activist, you can run campaigns, uh, perhaps of the type that Farah just mentioned, hoping to garner sufficient community support uh, to your cause to force governmental intervention. As a community member, you can write to or meet with your politicians or make submissions to any inquiries that happen to be happening. As a lawyer, maybe you can develop some kind of a test case to take to court in the hope that it will result in some kind of reform. And again, all of these methods can be very useful in achieving significant change. In my view, criminal law reform is a process that should be addressed from as many different angles as possible. But to some extent, these efforts are often inhibited due to what would be called a siloing effect, where each individual or group acts in their own domains without substantive interactions between them. And I think this is unfortunate because it could be possible to create a much stronger impetus for law reform by bringing together people from disparate spheres with different skills to follow some kind of a targeted strategic plan for reform. Now, I've just been involved in, in this kind of a campaign uh, in Victoria, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, before doing so, I should note that this campaign did take place in Australia, uh, which, as you may know, has a common law system based on the English model. Uh, while I believe the approach I'll be talking about could be readily adapted to other common law jurisdictions such as the United Kingdom, Canada, New Zealand, uh, so on, I'm not sure how translatable it would be to jurisdictions with a civil law system. So I would be interested to hear uh, any views on that afterwards. So the legal issue that this campaign addressed was the way in which personality disorders should be taken into account in sentencing. Since you're not all Australian sentencing scholars like me, let me give you all a little bit of background to this issue. In 2007, in a landmark decision called Verdon's, uh, the Victorian Court of Appeal identified six different ways in which impaired mental functioning can mitigate an offender's sentence. It can reduce their culpability for the offence. It can affect the kind of sentence that should be given. It can moderate or eliminate the need for general or specific deterrence as sentencing considerations. Or it could affect a person's experience of punishment, either due to the sentence weighing more heavily on them or due to a deterioration of their mental health in prison, calling therefore for a reduced sentence. Now, these principles 
which came to be known as the Verdon's Principles and which were subsequently adopted in all Australian jurisdictions as well as in New Zealand, was stated to apply whenever the offender was shown to have been suffering at the time of the offence or at the time of sentencing from a mental disorder or abnormality or an impairment of mental function, whether or not that condition could properly be described as a mental illness. And the court in Verdon's made it clear that this was intended to be a broad definition. For example, there was no need for there to be a diagnosable illness or for the illness to be of a particular level of gravity. Uh, in the 2015 case of O'Neill, the Victorian Court of Appeal decided to restrict the application of these principles, excluding personality disorders from their scope. Uh, and they did so on the basis that they didn't consider personality disorders to be illnesses, which impact upon the capacity of individuals to perceive the world around them or to respond to it. And so they didn't think that personality disorders constituted a mental disorder or abnormality or an impairment of mental function. Now, I wrote my PhD about Verdon's and I had significant concerns about this judgment. Uh, to me, it appeared to demonstrate a lack of understanding of the nature of personality disorders, which can adversely affect a person's perception of the world and their response to it. That's the very reason why they're considered to be disorders. Uh, it also minimised the potential effects of personality disorders, which can significantly impair a person's mental functioning. Now, these misunderstandings and the limitation of the operation of the Verdon's principles seems likely to prevent the courts from being able to appropriately tailor their sentences to the specific needs of the offenders, such as by ordering appropriate treatments for personality disorders that have been shown to be effective. And I thought this seemed likely to result in significant injustice for some of the most disadvantaged and vulnerable people in our society. So I decided that I should do something about it. Now, while my initial inclination as an academic was simply to write an article critiquing the decision, I thought that was unlikely to have much impact coming solely from a legal academic. So instead, I approached one of Victoria's leading forensic psychiatrists, Dr. Andrew Carroll, to see if he was interested in co-authoring a paper with me. Fortunately, he was, uh, and so we wrote a detailed critique of the decision, both from a legal and a psychiatric point of view. And we published this article in one of Australia's leading generalist law journals, the Melbourne University Law Review. Having laid the groundwork for our future advocacy, we then decided to promote our message. Now, it seemed unlikely that the government was going to be interested in this issue, as we were advocating for offenders with personality disorders to be treated more leniently, which really doesn't sit very well with the law and order agendas of all major Australian political parties. But it also wasn't actually an issue that required governmental intervention, because this wasn't, there wasn't a specific statute that needed to be amended. The law in the area had been developed by judges and so could be changed by judges. So judges became the main target of our advocacy. Using our different networks, we both managed to secure speaking engagements at various events that were widely attended by the Victorian judiciary. So for example, I spoke at the Victorian County Court Judges Annual Conference. Dr. Carroll spoke at an event organized by the Judicial College of Victoria. And our preliminary aim was one of consciousness raising to make judges more aware of the nature of personality disorders and the problems with the O'Neill judgment in the hope that if they ever had a case in the area, they would decide things differently. But we also realized there was little hope of this achieving substantial change because even if, for example, a county court judge was persuaded by our arguments, which many of them appeared to be, as lower court judges, they were likely to feel bound by the Court of Appeals judgment in O'Neill, 
and so would be unable to do anything about it. Even if they did take a different approach, it would have little precedential value and could be overturned on appeal. The best we could really hope for from these judges was a plea to the higher courts to change the law. So to help this along, we embarked on stage three of our plan, which involved <laughs> bringing a test case to court and powerfully presenting our arguments to the Court of Appeal. Now to achieve this, we needed the involvement of a legal practitioner working on the ground. So we approached Tim Marsh, who was the Chief Counsel of Victoria Legal Aid, who are an independent government funded organisation uh, that provides free legal representation to people who can't afford it. We were hopeful that legal aid would be supportive of our aims because the O'Neill decision would detrimentally affect a large number of their clients. Unfortunately, they were. So together, the three of us formed a strategy to try to identify a good vehicle for a test case at the earliest possible opportunity. This would allow Dr. Carroll to examine the client and prepare a very detailed report for use in the court proceedings. And it would allow Mr. Marsh to be involved from an early stage, presenting our arguments as powerfully as possible to the court. So Dr. Carroll and I approached various organisations such as Spectrum, who are Victoria's personality disorder service, and asked them to advise us of any cases they became aware of. And Mr. Marsh did the same through his legal aid networks. And it was in this way that we became aware of the case of a woman called Dahlia Brown. Now, Dahlia was a young woman who a few days after her 18th birthday had committed a series of minor arsons in supermarkets and convenience stores. Uh, a few days later, she set a fourth, much more serious fire at a vacant house where she used to live, burning it to the ground. And she pleaded guilty to a number of counts of arson. Because we were prepared for this, uh, Dr. Carroll was the, was the uh, psychiatrist who examined her uh, and he diagnosed her as having a severe personality disorder with detachment and a borderline pattern. And he considered this disorder to be very strongly linked with her offending, all of her motivations for setting the fires related to it. Dr. Carroll gave very powerful evidence about the nature of personality disorders in court. Uh, and he gave evidence about how in his view, these disorders clearly constitute an impairment of mental functioning. Now the judge at the sentencing hearing wanted a second opinion on this. And so he asked the prosecution to retain their own experts, which they did. Uh, and that expert gave similar evidence to Dr. Carroll about the nature of personality disorders because that view represents current psychiatric thinking in the area. Now, while the judge in the case was sympathetic to our views, as anticipated, he didn't feel himself to be bound by O'Neill. And so he held that the Verdon's principles applied. But in his sentencing reasons, as we'd hoped, he indicated his hope that the Court of Appeal would reconsider the law in the area. The case was duly appealed to the Court of Appeal, which convened a full bench of five judges to resolve the matter. Now, interestingly, by the time this case came to be heard, the prosecution themselves had come to agree that the Verdon's principles should apply to personality disorders. It had been persuaded by the strength of the evidence given not just by Dr. Carroll, but by their own expert, as well as the strength of the arguments presented in court by Mr. Marsh. And the court agreed. Jamie, I'm just, I'm sorry to interrupt you, just a new time is up. Yeah, all right, I'm just at the very end here. Okay. Uh, and, and the court agreed overturning the O'Neill decision, citing our work in the area, they noted that personality disorders can, should fall within the Verdon's principles. Uh, and in reaching this decision, as can be seen on this slide, the court recorded its appreciation of the constructive way in which the issue had been brought before it. Our approach had allowed it to reach its decision based on very high quality evidence, affirming what the court considered to be one of the law's most important aspirations, that decision-making should be evidence-based. Now, in some ways, this could just be considered a typical kind of test case, 
But what I think is unique about this, just to finish up, is that it really did involve a targeted strategic interdisciplinary collaboration between a legal academic, an expert witness, and a legal practitioner. And it was the complementary combination of our different networks and skills, my skills at constructing legal arguments and drafting articles and presentations, Dr. Carroll's psychiatric expert, Tease and skills uh, giving evidence in court, Mr. Marsh's skills as a barrister that provided a powerful basis for effective reform. And it's my hope that in the future, this kind of collaboration could be used as a blueprint in other areas of the criminal law. Thanks very much. Thank you to all our speakers for all the very interesting presentations. We are now going to move on to the Q&A section of um, this uh, round table. So we have one question and um, I'm very aware of the time, we only have 10 more minutes. So I would ask uh, speakers in answering the questions to be succinct. So the first question is from Hench Go. Good afternoon, I have two questions that I would like to ask panelists. To Prof Stanley, in your opinion, which area of the penal code in Malaysia is in need for reform the most? To Dr. Farah, in your opinion, which alternative sentencing would be the best deterrent for crime in Malaysia? So I suggest we go with Stanley first and then Farah. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. I think the short answer is uh, that uh, the Indian Penal Code, uh, 19th century instrument, uh, good as it was, uh, is antiquated in a sense that it doesn't have what I would have described as a, a chapter on general principles of criminal responsibility. Um, you'll find that many modern uh, criminal courts uh, actually utilize this uh, particular format. By what? By that I mean uh, general principles such as um, a section on or sections on the definitions of the uh, you know important uh, mental states, uh, the definition of intention, of knowledge, of belief, of uh, rashness, uh, and the like. Um, uh, definition or provisions on um, attempt that is much more. Section what's uh, 511 of your Malaysian Penal Code. Um, uh, a fuller uh, um, evaluation or, or, or clarification of what is meant by joint liability. Uh, looking uh, in further detail at all the general defenses uh, to ensure that they are comprehensive, that the gaps that have been identified over the years by Indian, Singapore, Malaysian and other courts uh, are, are, are filled in. Uh, properly by uh, legislature. So I think that's an important starting point to actually have a chapter on general principles of criminal mm -hmm. responsibility. Uh, the Singapore uh, night, uh, last year's um, Law Reform Act uh, attended to many of these. I think that as a starting point, if you are a Malaysian scholar or practitioner, um, it's well worth actually looking at and this is readily, uh, uh, readily available uh, on, on the website. Uh, if you Google um, something like Criminal Law Reform uh, Committee of Singapore, you'll find a 300-page document of the thinking of the committee in uh, recommending uh, certain revisions to the Singapore Penal Code, which I mentioned many of uh, them have since been implemented. So if you want a bit more of a commentary or background to these reforms that are now part of Singapore law, including things like the definition of intention and the like. Uh, that's a very good source uh, of information. Uh, so I think that there's nothing to stop a Malaysian practitioner uh, or scholar from uh, actually advocating, as Jamie has suggested, uh, using the Singapore experience uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the background uh, uh, discussion uh, to uh, advocate for the courts and, and also the legislature uh, to uh, make uh, these provisions uh, a part of Malaysian law. Thank you. Shall I answer that? Oh, sure. Okay, um, obviously, um, the alternative to uh, death penalty would be a life imprisonment. But the question is whether the life imprisonment should be uh, stipulated or otherwise. Because under our Criminal Justice Act at the moment, there are two types of life imprisonment. One is for natural life and the other one is uh, for uh, 30 years. Now, um, of course, it is also um, 
uh, our recommendation that uh, natural life imprisonment should be done away with um, as uh, it goes on the same principle as death penalty it is you know uh, it is indeterminate and this goes on so but the issue now here whether the uh, the life imprisonment ought to be 30 years or it ought to be 40 years in view of uh, in view of taking away the mandatory death penalty whether it ought to be with parole or without parole so these are among um, the recommendations that we, we we propose of course they are more definite uh, and and we hope that um, the AGC will take it up uh, further based on what we had recommended thank you very much um, the next question we have is uh, it's directed to all the panelists what is the role of the royal or presidential pardon in the criminal law process in particular in relation to the death penalty also what are the criteria for for pardon and how much discretion does the president of king have it's complicated and then um my suggestion is we take it one at a time shall we start with prof stanley then prof hall then dr farah and dr jamie if you have any thoughts maybe I, can i suggest uh, asking michael and uh, para to actually comment first uh, because uh, you know the 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 question uh, is targeted on pardons and the death penalty because i myself you know, would be interested in their views first michael so uh, maybe michael or para can you would you mind uh, 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 start giving an answer all right good yeah oh, uh, go, go, go ahead. okay okay <laughs> Oh, oh, you're waiting for me. Okay, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the, the power of pardon, I think it's, uh, it's about as discretionary as you can get. And uh, a king or president, well, president, I suppose, might, will refer to Singapore. And uh, king, perhaps, to the under the Putuan Agong of, of Malaysia. So, and, uh, uh, but in, in, in most systems, uh, that, uh, it, it, it is not the um, uh, uh, personal discretion of the uh, in Westminster system, it's not the personal discretion of the king or the president, and uh, it's essentially, essentially, um, a recommendation of the executive government, meaning the the cabinet. Yeah, or in places where there is a pardons board, uh, uh, then th that is the, where the recommendation comes from. Yeah, the position is. Are, are you done, Michael? Yeah. yeah, the position is quite similar to Malaysia, only that in Malaysia, because we we have also the state. Um, governing the matter because we have the state rulers so uh, depending on where the offense is committed then it will the, the final pardon will be with the respective South Sultan or the TYT the Timbalayan Nipper to a degree mm -hmm. now the, the but also they are assisted by the committee which is under the Aegis chambers now the the practical problem to this which led also to to the move towards abolishing a mandatory death penalty is that they don't sit um, regularly so you see, it puts again all this in uh, indeterminacy of of the plight of the death row prisoners. Because I, I remember when in in Johor Bahru, when the Sultan sat after a quite a number of uh, period, then he he released quite a a number of uh, death row uh, prisoners at that time. So um, as as the former. Um, Minister of Law had once said, you know, the criminal justice system is far from perfect. And in fact, it is, um, has so many flaws. So because of that, um, we really need to remove the MDP. I was wondering whether Stanley and Jamie have any thoughts to share? Just to, just to round up the round table because uh, we are nearly at the time, the lot of time. Yeah, that's a very quick one. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of... Uh... Uh, a very famous common law uh, case of Dudley and Stevens, uh, where the courts uh, sentenced to death uh, in England uh, someone who, you know, on a shipwreck who had uh, killed uh, a cabin boy and cannibalized he, uh, him, who pleaded the defense of necessity. And then uh, the, the courts said, no, uh, this defense is uh, not available to murder. And subsequently, uh, executive clemency uh, was actually. Uh, introduced or implemented, so they, it was commuted to six months imprisonment. I mean, that's a very rare kind of instance uh, where uh, you've got uh, the, the, the queen or the or king 
uh, actually pardoning and going contrary. I mean, it's, it's utilized as a, another form of, you know, if like work, working in tandem with uh, criminal justice uh, system to actually effect justice, right? But I think that uh, th those kinds of uh, occasions are very rare these days. Mm, yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And the same, I mean, in Australia, we don't have the death penalty, fortunately. Uh, so it's not, it's not an issue. But the use of that kind of discretion is incredibly rare uh, and is really only used in cases where there's been a very well-acknowledged miscarriage of justice that's mm -hmm. occurred for some reason. Uh, but generally... Uh, if even in those cases, the cases will end up going back to the court rather than relying on the use of that kind of executive discretion. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, I noticed that the time has come to, we've come to the end of our time. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank all our presenters, thank all our participants for tuning in and your questions today. And also thank the center for, um, in Sydney and in Singapore for helping to organize this. I myself have enjoyed this immensely and learned a lot. Thank you.